Bears in Space is one of the funniest and most unique first-person shooters I've played in recent memory. Developed by fellow Aussies, Broadside Games, a team comprised of only three people, who've apparently been working on this thing for the last seven years, all with the awful handicap of having to live in Queensland. Maybe we are. Who's asking? Either way, Bears in Space has just been released on Steam from Microsoft Windows. And if you're looking for a space-themed shooter similar to High on Life, only without all the obnoxious voice work and terrible jokes, well, then I've got good news for you. Uh, enough point, Dexter. Just tell us where we need to go and who to kill. The story is you're playing as a legendary space astronaut, Maxwell Adams, one job away from retirement, but demoted to captain of a prison ship which is soon attacked by the Bermada Alliance, who are trying to free a bunch of captive bears held on board. Release those bears in space immediately or you will be destroyed. So Max does his best to flee the scene using experimental hyperdrive technology, which accidentally fuses his DNA with a bear named Bertana, or BT for short. But you can call me BT for short. Everyone else does literally giving Max a voice in his head, but also a whole bunch of physical benefits, like increased movement speed, the ability to double jump and dash, zero fall damage, and an insatiable desire for honey. That's the honey, Max! Then after that, the overall plot is just about Max and BT trying to make their way back to Earth, I think. Yeah, honestly, I kinda lost the plot there and I forgot what I was supposed to be doing. Which is probably fine, I mean, that loose premise is really just an excuse to explain why the play is going from one area to the next. Okay, let's get out of here. Along with giving the developers carte blanche to really create whatever wacky stuff they want. And it doesn't take too long to play this thing to see just how out there it actually is, easily allowing you to draw comparisons to other similar themed shooters, like High on Life and the Borderlands series. Especially too in the way that Bears in Space draws heavily on pop culture references. I'm Ronnie Botsville and this is the Jumping Into Acid. <laughs> And this is where the game absolutely excels in all the various little throwbacks and homages which paint a pretty good picture as to the sense of humour that these developers have. I mean, I would go absolutely mad just trying to keep track of all the various Simpsons and Seinfeld references alone. Now, now dig up, stupid. There's a few different sequences that are a homage to the Point Blank games, along with another one that's an even bigger reference to Time Crisis allowing the player to pop in and out of cover as they fight for the top spot on some kind of intergalactic cooking show. Yeah, that's something that actually happens. You enter my domain! Now impress me with your skills! There's references to Men in Black with a trip to a familiar looking underground headquarters, along with a weapon that's more or less just the noisy cricket. Then there's references to Metal Gear Solid. Barrel? Godzilla, and an even more thinly veiled throwback to Unreal Tournament, where you're in combat inside what's more or less a recreation of the map facing worlds. Oh yeah, and your prize for beating that section is basically just the flat cannon. Throughout the game, you'll often turn into bear form, replacing all of your weapons with bear claws. And this is like a combination of the berserk mode from Doom, causing your hands to become literal killing weapons. But then they also start adding in Ryu and Ken special moves from Street Fighter, with a Shuriken and a Hadouken. Oh yeah, and in fact too, like speaking of Doom, one of the later levels where you're jumping from piles of debris floating in space feels a hell of a lot like the Mars core in Doom Eternal. Another sequence manages to combine a reference to Cobra Kai along with a Test Your Might minigame from the original Mortal Kombat. Certain levels even have you running around a small area trying to collect all the letters to spell out the word atoms, which is very similar to collecting the letters for skate in the old Tony Hawk games. <laughs> they even found a fun way to work in these little shoot 'em up mini games in between certain levels, and all of this stuff is within the first couple of hours of the game. There's a really funny running gag here as well, where you keep coming across this robot with a deep gravelly voice who talks about how important family is and how he likes to live his life one quarter micron at a time. The most important thing in life will always be winning this race right here, right now. And even after this robot crashes and is apparently killed, he still pops up again another few times throughout the campaign reusing the same shtick. Bachelor number one, what's your idea of a perfect date? I'd take you to meet my family. 
Because nothing is more important to me than family, not even the quarter micron. But even then, like the stuff that's not referencing something else and actually has original writing is still genuinely funny to listen to. Looking to buy a hat? Sorry, bud, you come to the wrong place. This is the Harbour Bike Appreciation Club. Max doesn't really talk all that much, leaving most of the dialogue and the exposition to BT, who acts the exact kind of way you'd expect that a hyper-intelligent, murderous bear would. Oh, I agree. That's the bear code way too. And then almost every single other character you interact with is a robot, most of whom look like the one from the original Lost in Space. And yeah, thankfully too, none of them devolve into being loud and squeaky voiced, nor do they run their mouth for two minutes straight, completely filibustering to the point that it just becomes annoying. Uh, so Applebee's, it's in the slums, which you, you know, you, you probably knew that, so your suit can point us in the right direction, so you take the lead, bounty hunter, you, you, you know, we'll talk with, you know, we'll, we'll, we're gonna, we'll... shut up! My favourite moment is one where you've just snuck into a robots only pub and you need to find a pair of wax lips for the robotic bartender named Whistling Pete. Yeah, wax lips, it's the candy of a thousand uses. One, a humorous substitute for your own lips. Mm, keep going. Two, uh... Anyway, you do this by throwing bundles of dynamite into a giant pool of acid, until eventually the pool drains and you can grab the lips from off the bottom. Yep, that's them! Then you take those lips back to Pete, who immediately vanishes out the back, only to start then French kissing himself in the mirror. <laughs> and this is all done within the time span of about two or three minutes, making it one of the many offbeat but hilarious instances that seemingly come out of nowhere and disappear just as quickly. Right down, rookie. And a lot of the time, they don't even really make any sense, but they always manage to at least get a chuckle out of me. Like this medieval town you visit in the second episode, where every single robot you talk to is oddly obsessed with talking about hoverbikes. Beat it. I'm too busy thinking about hoverbikes. And it is kind of dumb at first, but then after like the fifth or sixth robot you run into is still crapping on about those things, it's kind of hard to not crack a smile. During one mission, I got teleported to some kind of police department and had to identify a murderer out of a lineup of identical looking robots. Which, yeah, is just kind of dumb to begin with, but it was all for nothing anyway, because as soon as I made my decision, the entire group just got smashed to bits. One thing's for sure if the killer was one of those guys, his days of murdering is over. So you're really doing yourself a bit of a disservice here if you don't try to do as many of these side missions as possible. You found me, Booty, but you won't leave alive. Not only do they give you extra cash, but they're also some of the funniest and most entertaining aspects of the game. Plus, it's just kind of refreshing to see writing in a cartoonish game like this that doesn't need to rely on the low-hanging fruit of vulgar jokes just to make me laugh. And I mean, look, man, don't get me wrong, I like profanity and low-hanging fruit as much as the next guy. I mean, I'm the kind of person who thinks that putting fart noises into my videos is funny. But when you're playing a game where every single punchline is built around the notion that shouting and swearing alone is what makes something funny, well then, you know, you can just miss me with that stuff entirely. I'm gonna beat your ass, douchebag! What kind of inconvenience is this? Go to hell, douchebag! Learn how to drive, asshole! Oh yeah, whatever, whatever! <laughs> Visually too, there's a lot of variety between all these environments, and I definitely got a lot of PS2 vibes from certain eras too. Especially some of those earlier levels where you're moving around all of these factories putting robots out of commission. I mean, I had some serious ratchet and clank deja vu when I was playing through those sections. Bears in Space runs on the Unreal Engine 4, and it definitely has that whole Unreal Engine look to it, but for a game made by three people, it's about on par with what you'd expect. And they still managed to somehow work in different themes like medieval, horror, and of course science fiction as a backdrop into one game, which is a pretty damn admirable accomplishment. You're not going to be able to see the reflection of your character's face in the barrel of your gun or anything that extreme, but I mean, for what it is, it's a charming and comical looking game, and it gets the job done, which is all that matters. As for the actual gameplay, well, outside of a few mini-games here and there which shift up the camera perspective, Bears in Space is the first-person shooter through and through. The term boomer shooter really gets thrown around a lot these days, thrown around more than tickets to your mum's ping-pong show does. And while that is a good way to generalize Bears in Space, it is also worth noting that it takes a lot of influence from the bullet hell genre too, in the way that an abundance of harmful projectiles always seem to spew out in all directions from enemies during combat, most of which can be avoided, and in fact should be. 
the bullet hell genre is one that's actually been pretty popular too, with games like Returnal and The Binding of Isaac. But outside of titles like Robo Quest and Mother Gunship, I can't think of too many other first person shooters that have really put it to use. Which in a way, definitely makes Bear's combat a bit more interesting. Because while circle strafing is still ideal, the attack patterns of certain enemy projectiles, especially during boss fights, more lends itself to learning these movements. It also helps that the controls are tight and responsive, with weapon swapping being fast and almost instantaneous, and double jumping and dashing quickly becoming second nature. Which means it plays about as smooth as any other shooter you're going to get your hands or paws on. I played through Bears in Space on the so-called normal mode, and while things were kind of easy at the start, by the end of the campaign, things definitely got a lot more intense. Early on, you can just kind of get through the whole thing by flying by the seat of your pants, but by the time you're coming up against those tougher robots like Game, you really do need to start prioritizing the order in which to best take these guys out, which is where mobility and weapon swapping play a much more important role. Luckily too, there's a ridiculous amount of weapons on offer here, with there being 25 in total. Yeah, some of which I still haven't even unlocked. You've got the old chestnuts, the tried and true FPS archetypes, starting with the phaser, which is a pistol that has infinite ammo. Then there's the scatter laser, which is just a fancy name for a shotgun, along with the auto phaser, which is just a fancy name for an assault rifle. The Gatling Laser is like a more powerful version of the Auto Phaser, fitting into that whole Gatling Gun formula, and balancing out the extra damage it does by having an insane amount of weapon spread. Finally, there's the Gamma Launcher, which is just your standard rocket launcher, with a fast firing rate, and the Altman Fire able to load up three rockets at once. Yeah, I can't think of where I've seen that before. And these are the key weapons that I use the most, simply because you just can't beat that honest combo of a good shotgun, automatic weapon, and a rocket launcher. Plus, ammo for all of these seems to be the most common. But more than that, it's because these weapons can be upgraded after getting a certain amount of kills, which makes them that much more effective. Upgrading the phaser, for instance, lets you dual weld them, massively increasing your fire rate and damage output to the point that they're actually useful. You know, instead of feeling like you're firing hot farts at the enemies. Upgrading the shotgun not only improves the damage, but it also gives it an ultimate fire mode that lets you load up multiple shells at once, which can then be fired off in quick succession. And that right there is easily one of the best attacks in the entire game, even managing to shred through some of the bosses. But even just that basic upgrade for the Gatling Laser, which seems to do little more than just make it shoot faster and hit harder, becomes really useful later in the campaign, when the arenas in the combat starts to become genuinely challenging. It's with all the other weapons though where it starts to get a bit wacky, with some of these feeling downright experimental and the kind of thing you'd see in a weapons mod for Doom or Half-Life. They also kind of feel like the weapons you'd see in a postal game, just without them ending in bodily fluids spilled all over the place. For instance, you've got the propeller hat, a cap with a propeller on top, which sticks to the heads of the robots and sends them floating up into the sky where they explode soon after. And yeah, like it's definitely kind of funny at first, but it only seems to be effective against the smaller robots. You've got a basketball and then a basketball launcher, which is kind of interesting at first. Did you just make that shot? But for an explosive weapon, it doesn't seem to do all that much splash damage, making it seem like a less effective version of the rocket launcher. Along with that, there's the Armorang, a detachable arm which can be thrown out and even ricochets off multiple enemies before returning. You know, kind of like a boomerang. Or as we call them in Australia, throwing sticks. That throwing stick stunner yours has boomeranged on us. And then one of the more wackier weapons is the Anvil Launcher, combining the destructive, world-ending power of an anvil with the speed and accuracy of a rubber band. And then even more bizarre than that is the so-called Duck Gun. Right. Now this is a paper bag, like the one your mum keeps over her face, that's filled with exploding ducks, which you can then throw out at enemies like these fluffy little grenades. And then the online fire mode throws out a handful of breadcrumbs, which causes the ducks to home in on anyone hit by them. And again, like yeah, it gets points for creativity, but like the basketball launcher, both of these really play second fiddle to that raw alpha chat energy that radiates from the rocket launcher. Yeah. 
Even the tri-shooter, which is a missile launcher that locks onto three enemies at once, really isn't as good as it could have been, because those missiles are far slower and again, less damaging than the rockets are. It doesn't really help either that a lot of these secondary weapons don't seem to have upgrades, making it seem kind of pointless to really waste your time with them to begin with. You know, considering that time could be spent far better with something that's going to be objectively improved. Outside of that, there's utility items you'll need to use too, like the binary gun, which is used from a distance to activate panels remotely. And this not only shows off some more creative level design, but it offers up a nice break from all the combat, going hand in hand with the platforming. Then there's the Dialbot, a bizarre little tool that gets you through locked doors, which you use almost two or three times. Along with the Magna Swing, which is really just a reskin grappling hook. And then to make the whole thing even more convoluted, there's different grenade types as well. So I will say one thing here, and that's that you're never going to be left wanting for new toys to play with. Simply because, you know, even 10 hours in, new weapons and mechanics were still popping up. I mean, it wasn't even until about the 9 hour mark where I got what's more or less the super shotgun and the lightning gun. The former being pretty self-explanatory, and the latter being more like a rail gun that arcs between enemies when they're hit. You'll probably notice early on too that a lot of the guns have a really low ammo capacity, with the shotgun, for instance, only being able to hold 12 shells in total. But as you're exploring all the levels, you're constantly coming across Vic Bucks, which is the most important currency in the universe. Yes, yeah, second only to Bison Dollars. Of course! And this can be used to buy ammo, new weapons, but more importantly, increase the ammo capacity for most of your guns. And I mean, it might not be the hardest shooter ever made, but when all those balls are flying around in your face in some of the later levels, you're really going to want to have as much ammo as possible here so you can spend more time shooting and less time running around trying to find ammo. That's a damn fine guarantee. And when it comes to actual complaints and critiques, I'm not sure how deep I could really go, considering that, like I said at the beginning, it's a game made by like three people. I will say though that one point of criticism I had is the overall length. Now all up, Bears in Space's campaign is probably about 12 or so hours long. And that's fine, but it could have easily been 7 or 8 hours with a few things trimmed here and there and probably been better off for it. And the reason for that is there's a lot of these interim moments in between combat and other scripted sequences where you're pretty much just walking around these mostly empty, uninhabited environments. In the game's defense, like, it is always throwing new weapons and minigames at the player. Like at one point near the end of the whole campaign, there was a sequence that I'd never seen before that was more or less a twin stick shooter that again just comes out of nowhere. But then it also just starts recycling a lot of the other things you've already done as well. And by the 10th time you've turned into a bear, or the second or third time you're playing through another one of those time crisis or point blank sequences, I mean the novelty has well and truly worn off. It's kind of like having a stand-up comedian telling you the same joke you've already heard before. I mean, you're still likely to give them a chuckle, but it's not going to get the same belly-aching laughter as it got before. No. Same thing with the amount of times they use the backdrop of the player fighting a boss in some kind of large arena. I mean, any one of these alone would absolutely serve well as an endgame boss, you know, in the sense of the scale and the length. But it's a format that gets used almost every single time you fight one of these larger enemies. After a while too, the combat just really becomes a familiar rhythm of using the same three or four weapons over and over until everyone's dead. And about the only new addition you get is bigger robots that fire out bigger projectiles, which isn't something that takes all that long to adapt to. And yes, like, I realise that complaining about a game giving you more content does sound kind of stupid, but I still think that tightening up a few of the levels would have done wonders for the campaign's overall pacing. Especially in a game that lets you replay levels to find the dozens of secrets, side missions, and collectibles. And I gotta say that by the end there, I was well and truly ready to see those credits. Still though, minor issues aside, I'd easily recommend Bears in Space to pretty much anyone. I didn't think you had it in you! It's fast, colourful, funny, and unique. Plus the fact that it lacks any vulgar, profane, or adult content means it's the kind of thing that everyone can play and enjoy. I mean, look, as much as I love ripping a demon's head in half with my bare hands, or chainsaw sliding through a group of cyborgs, sometimes shooting a bunch of hostile robots with a rusty water cannon can be just as much fun. That's a damn fine guarantee. I sure hope it doesn't take these guys another seven years to make their next shooter, but if it's half as soulful as Bears in Space is, well, then at least it'll be worth the wait.